Hello, everybody. Uh, it is fabulous to be back with you at Hospitality Talks with my co-host, Sam Eric. We have just celebrated the Earth Day last week, so this topic is very appropriate with a renewed commitment of global leaders towards sustainability. Sustainability and social responsibility is fast becoming a prime concern for public and private sectors and hotel industry is no different. Um, this topic in uh, hospitality has been debated for decades. Hoteliers are charged with uh, reducing the negative impact on the environment. Well executed sustainable practices make hospitality organizations stand out and provide a competitive advantage. In addition to natural resources, we also need to be mindful of social and economic resources, and all these elements are inextricably linked. Tourism particularly relies on the natural and cultural resources that attract tourists and act as the main driver of growth and development in the tourism economy. Hospitality organizations' success depends on preserving these attractions that compel tourists to visit these destinations, and not doing so has major consequences. Our discussion today will help us better understand why sustainability is key for the future of hospitality industry and why an immediate action is needed. I am Abbott Butt. And I'm here with my co-host, Sam Eric Ratman. Sam. Thank you, Abid. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this uh, uh, conversation today with, this, with a panel that we have who are distinguished in their, and experts in their fields. Uh, it just reminds me that uh, we, which we talked earlier with Abid that we both have been working quite a long time in this industry and the discussion about sustainability has been going on for a very long time. I remember attending some conferences in the 80s and it was it was called responsible tourism etc at the time but uh, i think what uh, what reminds me is that uh, do, do not let the good crisis go to waste as we have had now so it's an opportunity to really do get do something and and get uh, seriously uh, acting on on the, the way we have to do in order to save our planet that's the only one we have because there's no planet b so a bit if it's all right with you let's bring the panel panelists to, to the discussion. Absolutely. So Sam, today we are fortunate to have um, Ufi Ibrahim, who is founder and chief executive of the newly formed Energy and Environment Alliance with us. It's a nonprofit organization established to transition the hospitality industry to a zero carbon economy and, and lead on sustainable investment and operations. Um, Ufi has been involved with organizations like British Hospitality Association, World Tourism and Travel Council, and Food Farming and uh, Countryside Commission. As a matter of fact, in 2009, she led the travel industry's first global commitment to cut carbon emissions by 50% by 2035, working with WTTC and Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership. We also have Dr. Jonathan Day with us, who is an associate professor in Purdue School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. With the over 25 years of experience in tourism management, Jonathan work, his work as of late has focused on sustainable tourism and responsible travel and how tourism can be used not only to enrich travelers, but support destinations and communities. And last but not least, uh, Zania Hohenlo, uh, who is a hotelier by background, but a founding partner with Considerate Group, a change-making company that helps hospitality businesses operate responsibly. Their focus is very much on driving companies to perform better financially, have a solid ESG strategy, data transparency, and achieving a positive impact 
for the sector as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Welcome to Hospitality Talks. So Sam, if it's okay, I think we'll have uh, uh, Jonathan lead us out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jonathan, you have been involved with several organizations all around the globe. Uh, it, help us understand what is sustainability and why is it so complicated? Yeah, sure. It, it's such an honor to be here. I'm so glad to be able to talk about this topic with you um, and to sort of share some time with these, the, the other panelists here. I'm really looking forward to an interesting conversation. I think that one of the challenges with sustainability is that it's a simple idea that is quite complicated underneath. And as you unpack it and sort of think about it, you realize that it's many different things. So, you know, it, it, it may seem a little bit um, trite to sort of start with a de definition, but, but let's do that, you know? And when we think about sustainability, quite often there are three elements of it. Um, the first is that it has both a short-term and a long-term perspective. You know, this idea that um, we'll be looking after our current assets um, uh, with the consideration for not only, um, not only, you know, the next 10 years, but for generations to come. Um, and so when we look at some of the natural assets, some of the cultural assets that we have, we're preserving today and we're, we're considering about tomorrow. The second element of it is this idea of, of balancing three different bottom lines. So, you know, we're so used to thinking about the bottom line in terms of profit, um, in terms of money. But the triple bottom line idea is that we're balancing out not only profit, but also environmental impacts and social and cultural impacts. And um, so what, what we're basically doing is that we're saying that, um, you know, we want to maximize the benefits from each of those things and then minimize the costs. Because we know that tourism has some costs, there's negative impacts. Um, we need to address that. And then we need to be making sure that um, we're reducing them as much as we possibly can. And then of course, the third part is that we're engaged with the communities that we're in, that tourism shouldn't just happen to you. And in many of the places where you're seeing the greatest pushback against tourism, um, we see that those destinations really haven't had a voice in how their destination um, grows tourism. You know, this notion that tourism is going to be a great thing for everyone is just clearly not true unless you work hard towards it. So when we talk about the benefits of tourism, we need to recognize that we actually need to apply sustainable tourism to get those benefits. Now, that basically all of those things you can sort of look at and say, oh, yeah, I agree with that. But then when you unpack them, and you start to think, well, that's not just one thing. This is many different things. Um, that's where we get into the challenge of implementing sustainable tourism. And I think that it's really important, you know, in that process, we need to be thinking about, well, where, you know, what can I do as an organization to contribute? And, you know, this is where a hotelier who is part of the bigger destination system can really have a contribution to tourism, to tourism sustainability. Um, but, but, you know, our, our hotels can't burden, uh, can't be burdened by the whole responsibility of sustainability. Sustainability is something that happens right across a community and across a destination. And so really what we're going to be thinking about is how can we as hoteliers, you know, really contribute in the most positive way towards an outcome that is going to be best for everyone. Well, Jonathan, it, tourism by one study uh, uh, contributes nearly 5% to the global greenhouse emissions, uh, uh, generally speaking. And I think if, if the travelers uh, knew that they are contributing to the great garbage pack in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Pacific or the impact of their travel 
that it has on environment, I don't think anybody would feel comfortable in doing it. But the flip side of it is tourism is one of the largest employers as an industry globally. So it is really impacting the small businesses, small communities. How do we balance the two? Uh, how do we make sure that it is done responsibly so that the future generations will continue to enjoy, but yet reduce the negative impacts? Yeah, sure. And, and you know, I'm not altogether convinced that consumers don't know that they are contributing to, um, to some of the negative outcomes. The, the current... Um, the current way awakening to the costs of tourism is really um, is quite telling, and and we're seeing this, you know, with the idea of you know reducing our flights. You've got the French government sort of looking at how we can, you know, limit um, short haul flights. The flight shaming idea um, that we we should change our behaviours, um, and I think that that is an important part of it. Um, certainly consumers need to work hard to sort of think about how they can still have a good time um, because, you know, we don't want to, you know, we, we travel for a whole lot of reasons, how they can still have a good time, but how they can, um, they can travel more responsibly. But I got to tell you, you know, let's bring this around to the hoteliers. You know, what can the hoteliers be doing to, to ensure that the travelers uh, experience is um, is as responsible as possible. And in that respect, I think that there are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. You mentioned carbon emissions, right? So one of the elements of sustainability is the environment. And, you know, in the environment, one of the biggest issues that we have is climate change. So where does the hotelier fit into that? Well, you're right, you know, about five to seven percent of um, uh, carbon emissions come from the tourism industry. Big chunk of that comes from aviation and one of the biggest things that we need to be working on is how do we change the aviation system so that we're using different fuels. Second biggest chunk of it is right in your wheelhouse. It's about how hotels build and operate their buildings. Buildings are, uh, buildings create um, greenhouse gases and contribute to the thing. So we've got two issues. One is, what do I build? You know, am I building um, uh, am I building my hotels so that they are energy efficient, that they're reducing water wastage, um, and then do I operate my hotels in a way that reduces energy? And of course, you know, reduces energy, reduces waste. Um, food waste is a big part of uh, 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 greenhouse gas uh, emissions, um, it all sort of ties in together. And so, you know, the first question is, as a hotelier, am I building right? A second one is, am I operating correctly? Am I operating in the way that is reducing these things? And of course, you know, the good thing about that is that by operating energy efficiently and reducing our wastes, we can actually be reducing our costs as well. And I'm sure that we'll talk about that a little bit more. But, you know, the other thing that we need to do, and because we have a, a, an industry that has a voice, you know, one of the things that we need to be doing is uh, encouraging system change. Now, you know, a couple of years back, I met the incredible Hervé Udra. Um, who ran the Willard for a long time um, as one of the most sustainable hotels in the country, the Willard there in Washington, D.C. He went on to do some other work. And he was telling me about how his hotel was run on renewable energy. And I had this vision of, you know, on the top of the bloody Willard, we would see um, windmills. Of course, that's not the case. What what he was doing was he was, um, with the utility that he was using, he was asking that his uh, energy comes from uh, renewable sources. And that is a voice. As we talk to the utilities and the companies that are actually delivering um, 
energy to our businesses, we need to be pushing for that sort of system change. It shouldn't be acceptable to us that um, the only energy that we can purchase is the you know is that is that that comes from uh, coal powered plants. And so you know there's the things that we do ourselves, the way we build, there's the things that we operate, but then there's the voice that we have in our supply chain, and the supply chain goes up as well into the energy and recycling and water distribution that we need to be voicing our concerns for sustainability. Jonathan, we'll, we'll definitely talk a bit more about that. Unfortunately, the, the supply cycle of some of these renewable energies and resources is still a bit of a challenge in certain parts of the world, but I'm going to go back to destinations. During the pandemic, of course, some of the, the destinations with cultural sites have seen a bit of a reprieve, whereas destinations with natural resources, a lot of uh, the big outdoor, if you would, have had uh, a, a lot of people visiting because that was the only thing you uh, could do during this pandemic. How are destinations being responsible for this and protecting their resources and what can be done differently? Yeah, so it's been a wonderful time to see some destinations really do some planning around what is responsible travel. And uh, all around the world, including here in the US, we're seeing destinations really embrace, you know, not just one or two of these elements of sustainability, but the whole, the whole complex set of things that need to be done to make things sustainable. One of the things that we need to think about when we when we're thinking about, you know, coming back to your question, you know, how do we make it, um, how do we get the benefits of tourism uh, in, in our destinations in particular? And what, again, one of the um, ways that we can as hoteliers is to consider, you know, who we're buying our supplies from. Quite often we sort of think about sustainability as sort of within the box as, as you know, what am, what am I doing? But as hoteliers uh, and as any business, you know, who we buy our materials from, you know, are we, are we, um, are we sourcing locally? Uh, are we able to make sure that the people who uh, live in, in our area um, not only have jobs, but have career paths that can take them higher up into the organization? You know, these are the sorts of things that we need to be encouraging um, you know, from, from the hoteliers and, and from the various suppliers in the tourism system. So destinations are working to put these things in place. Um, and I think that it's really important for us to understand that some of these things are bigger than tourism, right? So when I talk about you know, changing the energy sources that we're using in these utilities, that's bigger than tourism. We need to be, as an industry, pushing above into the community and into the, the bigger business world, saying that this is what we're expecting. And then we need to get our house in order, making sure that we're energy efficient. And we haven't even talked about um, many of the issues that are uh, important in terms of um, our social relationship, uh, our, our social justice issues in our industry. Um, so we need to get our house in order. And then the other thing is we need to be helping our clients to travel responsibly. Many of the large corporate um, buyers are really struggling with how do we make this, uh, how, how can we make our travelers uh, more responsible, more, uh, more sustainable? And we as hoteliers have a real opportunity to be their partners in that process. Here is how you can do it more efficiently. This is what I'm doing to make it better. And this is how I can help you. So these are all things that I think are important when we think about the systems problem of sustainability and where does the hotelier fit into that problem? J Jonathan, uh, uh, I think all of us struggle in the industry quite candidly. It's the how that all of us struggle with. And I'll turn it over to Sam here in a bit, but the latest 
buzzword, if you would, particularly during the pandemic, has been the regenerative travel. Help us understand what that's about. How does that help uh, uh, sustainability efforts? And, and what role can that play? Yeah, for sure. I think that that's really interesting. So, you know, what I love, is that as we come out of this pandemic, there is this growing desire to bounce back better, to come back better than we were before. Um, and really that is, you know, that notion of how can we do things better in the future is, you know, sort of really at the core of the discussions that we're having at the moment. Now, sustainability has been around for a long time. And it's very clearly, you know, although it's complicated, there are many things that, is, that are very clear on what you should do and how you can do it. But some people sort of feel, and quite rightly so, that as sustainability as an idea has been embraced by various companies, it's really just become, how can I not do bad? How can I, you know, what is, what, what is it that I can do to reduce the negatives as opposed to what can I do to make things better? The way that I like to, to uh, c compare and contrast this, you know, for a long time we've said sustainability is about um, when you visit a destination that you take only memories and you leave only footprints. Um, I am told, and, that, and, and that's a good sentiment, I am told that there's a Girl Scout, um, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I'm told that the, the Girl Scouts are always told, you know, don't just, leave, don't just leave it the way you found it, leave it better than the way you were. And there is this trend about building things better and leaving things better. And it's come over the last 20 years. It's, it's grown up beside sustainability and supports sustainability. And it's this idea that, you know, when we build a building, instead of just being carbon neutral, it should be sucking carbon out of the, world, uh, out of the air and, and making and reducing carbon. Um, we're seeing that, uh, so we see that in uh, architecture. We see it in uh, our agriculture as well, where, you know, we're looking to put new, um, uh, enrich the soil that we're taking from as we go. And these ideas are coming into tourism. So I don't see regenerative as being that different from tourism. And in fact, I'm excited about the extra energy that's coming as associated with it, that people are thinking about it. It just really sort of, instead of focusing on the part that is reducing the negatives, in my mind, what it does is it focuses on how can we increase the positives? And if we can do that, um, balancing those two things um, and regenerative helps us to do that, then I think it's a really good thing. And so again, what does that mean to a hotelier? It means that you know the design of our hotels may change just as they did when we started to adopt LEED uh, certification and, and similar things to lead over the last couple of years. It may mean our buildings change, and that's good because buildings are a big part of carbon. Um, it may mean that we start to look at how we reduce our waste because a big part of regenerative is this new idea of circular economy instead of just throwing things out, finding different ways to use it. And so these are the sorts of things that I think, you know, we're seeing hoteliers you know, sort of slowly starting to grapple with. And, and there are some exciting um, early movers in this process that, uh, that are getting some attention at the moment. And hopefully they're creating a good um, example for the rest of us. You know, it, the, the irony is that in emerging economies, maybe as a necessity, maybe as a doing a good thing, there is a concerted effort of reusing the material. It's the mature economies that get this throwaway mentality that that uh, uh, conveniences overtake uh, whatever else is there. So uh, let me turn it over to Sam and I'll be back with you in a moment, Sam. Thank you. Uh, since you're a professor at the Purdue uh, uh, University in tourism management and so on, I'm actually interested, how is uh, how is the industry taking advantage of the 
the fresh brains that is coming out of the university to create innovative ideas to improve that sustainable aspect of tourism. Any aspect you want to share of about maybe happening within your school or are there other universities, uh, perhaps are competitions going on or what are the things that are you see in, from your point of view? Yeah, I see a variety. You know, there are a couple of associations out there here in the United States and, and uh, internationally that are really um, working hard to bring together academics and, and, um, and particularly our youngest, most brightest minds um, with the industry. Um, having said that, and not wishing to be necessarily a downer, I think that one of the real challenges is that unlike other industries, there's a disconnect. Um, a disconnect between some of the research that's happening and, uh, and some of the behaviors that uh, our hoteliers are um, uh, applying. And so one of, one of the reasons why I'm here today is that I think it's really important that we find a way to bridge the gap between what we are researching as academics and what we are doing as practitioners. Um, and so there's a real opportunity for that. Um, having said that, you know, you know there are great examples as, uh, uh, of, of connectivity between industry uh, around the place, but there's still a lot of work to be done uh, to improve that. Yeah. I, I just looked today, there is a Arabian Hotel Investment Conference coming up in September, and uh, they have a, they're announcing the winner of a competition. I think it's uh, the Hotel School in Haag. Uh, in Netherlands, and so they have had a, a team of students that have put innovative products, projects together, and then there are the industry leaders uh, from uh, 20 different company, hotel companies that will be then are the, are the juries for this. So I thought this is quite interesting that there's a, uh, <clears throat> a opportunity for uh, the industry to learn from the fresh brains who are coming out of the university, who are then... Um, learning the latest and also are not maybe stuck in their route of how to do things. So I thought that's quite interesting. Another thing which I may maybe mention, I, uh, I've been talking to a group of, uh, <clears throat> from a, a tourism university in Slovenia and they have a grassroots uh, group and they are now uh, helping these small service providers in Slovenia to, because who are not connected to, to websites, who are not connected to, uh, to the digital to get their voice also heard and so they can uh, be promoted for artisan work, whether it's a um, medical farm, a medical uh, herb farms or honey farms and so on, uh, because the, the Slovenia is, is uh, well known as what they call the for boutique tourism. There is not the mass tourism destination. So I just thought this was a kind of an inspiring idea. Then uh, we also have somebody from uh, University of Barcelona, Emma Thornberg, she is very interested in, in the sustainability, so she is eagerly watching this. So Emma, if you're watching us now, please, uh, uh, could you please uh, give uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan uh, maybe some question about what uh, goes into your mind since you are in Barcelona and you start studying sustainability. But for, uh, for you, uh, Jonathan, I would like to ask maybe looking at the future on uh, the future of tourism and the destinations or uh, do you see that there's a changes now? For instance, that uh, before pandemic, there was a big thing about the flug scum or fly shame, and it was flying was discouraged. But now we see again, uh, people have a pent up demand of fly flying out as quickly as they can. And um, is there a change of where people would like perhaps to travel? Uh, while I was looking at uh, Instagram at uh, hashtag sustainable travel, I saw people are going to very... Uh, exotic places where there is no mass tourism. So they're looking for something very unique that maybe they have never experienced before, and maybe they are one of the very few who will see it. Uh, glamping comes to mind. Uh, any thoughts on this? So that's a big question, Sam Eric. Um, <laughs> you've covered a lot of ground there. Um, yes, I do think that people are coming back. Uh, I think it's important that just to, to recognize that, that um, not all small-scale tourism is sustainable tourism, just like not all mass tourism is unsustainable. Um, and so, you know, certainly, uh, you know, both of those require um, strategies in place to make sure that the, the benefits of tourism come out. 
Um, I do think that there are some moves that will change and, and, and a snowballing effect towards sustainability. Um, not only do I believe that consumers are concerned about this, um, but you know, I think that we're going to see some policy initiatives. Um, I mean, certainly in the United States, we've seen it. We've seen it in other countries as well, where there is a growing concern that will, you know, these policy issues will have an impact on the tourism system. They'll change some of the ways that we do. So I do think that sustainability is going to be an important topic for us. Um, as I sort of think about, you know, my concerns for the industry, and I think back to Abed's uh, original question. The one thing that I want to say is that, you know, I think too often we come to this conversation not aware of what has already happened. Um, and, you know, you can say, well, we've been talking about this for 20 years. The fact of the matter is for the last 20 years, we've been working on this and we've been improving our sustainability. Now, that is not to say that we are the you know, poster child for good sustainability, but it is to say that many of our organizations are working hard towards it. Many of the hotel companies are working hard towards sustainability. One of the things that worries me, you know, certainly I'm concerned about greenwashing. And I do think that there are folks out there who are, who are trumpeting their horns in ways that uh, are misleading. But I'm also really worried about green hushing. And that is where many hoteliers, and, and this is interesting part of our industry, um, are not communicating what they actually are doing. Now, there's all sorts of reasons why that happens, but what it what ultimately means is that we have no baseline. We don't know how our industry is performing. I don't think that that's sustainable. I think that our big corporate buyers are going to demand. Um, information uh, from us because it's part of their sustainability issues as well. And so I think that it's really important for us to sort of, um, you know, certainly not, you know, to be transparent, to to start sharing the information. And, and you know, it's, it's easy to take pot, pot shots because, you know, I could be doing, you know, 13 things right and two things wrong and the and it feels like, you know, all the people sort of focus on are the two things that are wrong. Right. Um, so I think that we, we sort of dodge, um, dodge trying to talk about it. But I got to tell you, you know, if I wanted to buy a, 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 you know, a sustainable hotel room tonight, how the hell would I find out? You know, if I went to an OTA, I'd have to go, I couldn't find out any information. I, I could buy an organic orange off the shelf at the at the grocery store, but to find out whether the hotel that I'm staying in is sustainable, really difficult. And you know, I could dig around into the hotel's um, corporate so social responsibility reports and whatever, but you know, as the consumers are looking for this information, it's really important that we we get that message on the shelf. Thank you. We Thank tell you. People what we're doing, and so. Yeah, green hushing, but, but you know, green washing is an issue for sure. Green Thank hushing, you. a bigger issue. Okay. Thank you very much. And then uh, over to you, Abid, for the final question. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, please stay with us. Uh, at this point, I would like to bring in our next guest. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have you back in a moment. But uh, 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 Sam, let's bring in Ufi Ibrahim. Uh, Ufi, you've been dealing in this uh, industry and particularly on sustainability. Uh, can you highlight some successes that we can celebrate, uh, some improvements that have been made over the years? Well, there have been, uh, there's been a lot of progress even beyond our industry. Let's, let's go back to 1992 to the Rio Earth Summit. At that time, sustainability and climate change was, uh, was you know, being pursued and promoted by the institutions, the big global institutions, by the scientists, and that has changed. That's trickled down. So now we find that national governments and we find that the financial community, the institutional investors in particular, have now picked up that mantle and are actively demanding evidence on climate change activity, how, you know, climate change risk mitigation, they want companies to actually report back. And that has created a big shift 
in terms of the momentum with which companies and businesses are now prioritizing sustainable design, sustainable development and sustainable practice as well. That's really the big fundamental shift that has happened. And even within that shift, there are shifts happening. So now we're moving beyond national governments talking about this issue and setting targets to actually legislating in this area. Jonathan talked about the legislation, the lawmakers that the French, you know, the French lawmakers deciding to um, ban short haul flights where there is a train service available. Any flight under two hours, if there's a train available, there's no need to fly anymore. There's real action, legislative action coming from governments. Take the United Kingdom, for example, where the government is pursuing within Parliament, it's actually getting to the last hoops in Parliament now to become an act, to become legislation, the requirement for climate change disclosure, financial reporting, where public companies will be required in future to actively and transparently um, report on how they are mitigating climate risk. So there is a lot happening on the legislative front. And as I said, there's also these changes trickling down through the institutional investors through the financial community as well. So, you know, the second big driver of corporate and business, uh, investment activity. So you can take the big um, opportunity of today, the big green funds that are available, huge amounts of money flowing into ESG funds. In fact, looking at any um, financial markets around the world, in the USA and Europe, even in some parts of Asia, we are seeing that ESG funds are outperforming other funds um, in every country. We're also seeing that in more and more institutional investors are starting to take proxy action. So they're taking definite action against businesses who are failing to meet certain ESG targets. Now, at the moment, that proxy action is being taken with big corporations, but it's just a matter of time before it trickles down to smaller investments that these institutional investors have. So we're seeing a lot of activity. Take lenders, for example, banks. You know, there are brown discounts now being um, applied to, to funds, be it you know, funds that are being borrowed or even the value of assets. So hotel asset values are already now, today, having brown discounts applied. So when you ask me about you know, change, what's happened, what, what, what developments have happened, a lot has happened and a lot is happening. And in terms of successes, yes, there are many companies in our industry who have done things. Many have actually um, taken up, for example, the renewable energy that we offer as an organization. We offer that, we have a, a procurement scheme where hoteliers are actively buying collectively, they're buying renewable energy in order to manage those costs. These things are happening, they're live. So there are good examples out there, but there are still some fundamental basics which aren't there, which we have to actively address. And you know, my organization together with others such as Briam are trying to get our heads around these very simple, but very important uh, metrics so that we can actually guard against what Jonathan referred to as greenwashing. Because until we get those metrics in place, arguably a lot of the reporting out there could be um, interpreted as being greenwashing. So take one example. There isn't a standard metric in the industry today for measuring floor area in hotels. Well, if you can't have a common standard for measuring your floor area in hotels, Agreeing, for example, if the golf course is part of that um, floor area measurement or the outdoor swimming pool or the outdoor car parks, um, then how can you begin to actually have a common measurement for carbon emissions for a building? So very simple things, very practical things, very pragmatic that we have to address. We are addressing, we're working on them. They are very technical. They are very complex but they must be addressed and they must be addressed quickly and effectively because the pressure that we are feeling from the financial markets and from governments is um, at its highest at this particular point in time. And it's just going to be um, more and more important to do this in a timely fashion. And of course, then when hit by COVID. <clears throat> so right now our hoteliers, many of whom are fighting for survival, 
um, you know, are if you like, you know, prioritizing other aspects of of their financial viability as an organization. So it's a great opportunity to do things differently. It's a great opportunity to take a really firm look at the cost and the bottom line. But there's a lot that has to be put in place to give that support so that hoteliers can actually be enabled to be more environmentally and socially and in terms of governance, a better operator. Well, you know, th it, COVID uh, might have helped in certain cases, but it, it might have um, taken us back a bit on some of the basic things like single use containers and that sort of stuff. Because of COVID, they were brought back where they might have been done away with earlier. But Ufi, uh, looking at uh, uh, other sectors, other industries, uh, are we doing as well as some of the others? Is there a comparison to be had where we can learn from other industries or are we out on our own? Well, the reality is that our industry is a laggard in terms of um, environmental sustainability in particular. So take, for example, the United Kingdom. Our economists at Ignite Economics undertook some research using government data. And one of the wonderful things in the United Kingdom is that the UK government has been tracking energy usage, they've been tracking energy intensity, and they've been tracking the use of fossil fuels versus renewable energies across UK um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a whole economy, as a whole society, um, since 1989. So they have annual data on this in this area. And we looked at that data, and what we found was um, was a telling story in terms of our industry being so laggard, in fact, that we rank at the very bottom of the pile with the mining, quarrying, and construction sectors in terms of our energy intensity. And energy intensity means it's the amount of energy that you utilize to produce one level of economic output. So a very damning um, reality, um, which we found, and this, there's a similar story in terms of this split between the amount of renewable energy we use versus fossil fuel. We're not doing very well in that respect either. And while the overall UK economy has, since 1989, actually significantly cut the amount of energy they're using, our industry has increased the amount of energy it's using. So on all three measures, our industry is actually laggard uh, rather than leader. And we have, you know, I've, I've had many um, people from within the sector saying, well, is this a good message to be giving out? Should we be so transparent about the fact that we're laggard? The answer is absolutely, we must. We have to draw the line in the sand somewhere. And this is a good starting point to actually put the hands up, be transparent and say, this is the reality. There are facts available and these are trusted sources of data. And what we now have to do is actually measure, based on those trusted sources, our performance as we improve um, going forward year on year. Of course, the COVID um, year is going to be an exceptional one, but as the industry gets back to, uh, to performing, especially um, economies with significant domestic econ um, tourism, like the United Kingdom, for example, where the staycation um, act, you know, activity is going to be very, very high this year, uh, we will be able to start seeing how we are changing the split between fossil fuel and renewable energy, energy intensity, performance, energy um, efficiency, et cetera. And that's just energy. But there are and um, there is evidence in other areas also to show that there is a lot of room for improvement for our sector to actually move forward. That's not a bad thing. It just means that we have a lot to contribute um, to actually tackling climate change continuing to reduce poverty and all the other aspects that make us probably, you know, one of the shining lights for sustainability in the future, even if it's not the case today. Well, well I guess in, in, if we want to attend to some of the issues, the, the, the first thing and the best thing is to be able to recognize where we're starting from, as discouraging as it might be that we've gone the other way, uh, um, but at least we know where we are and what has to happen. Uh, I'll turn it over to Sam here in a bit, but why is it that our industry hasn't gained ground? Why is it that we are almost regressing uh, 
it, uh, by now, I would have thought that we would definitely have major boxes that we would have checked since this topic is not new. Well, the fragmented nature of the industry has definitely um, slowed slowed the, uh, the the speed with which and the effectiveness with which we are able to actually transform our businesses and embed sustainability throughout all the operations. And it's not enough just to embed sustainability in your operations for today. You have to look at the entire life cycle of your your assets. You have to look at the life cycle of everything that you do. So. There is a lot of effort required and a lot of input required um, because the majority of our businesses are actually quite small. There are very few organizations in our industry that can achieve B corporation status um, in the way that Microsoft, you know, Google, Amazon and others are, um, are actively now doing, as well as the automotive you know, manufacturers. Um, it will take more time for us because we're smaller. So there is fewer resource to be able to apply to, to making the investments needed to make that transformation as a business. So it will take more time. And that's where the importance of organizations like ours and others who can bring the collective together to work on collective technical solutions, collective um, cultural changes, behavioral changes, all the things that we need. The legal framework, for example, one of the things that we're developing currently, we're developing a whole repository of clauses and um, legal articles that can actually be lifted and put into, you know, occupational management contracts, HMA contracts, all sorts of contracts and agreements that that um, affect the way that we do business in our industry. We we need to create these things to support our businesses to make that change. So we're building that resource, that availability for them so that they can do it. We're equipping them to do that. Uh, and that's critical because they're, they're fragmented and they're small. The big five brands own very few assets today. So the onus falls upon the franchisee. And the franchisee, as I said, right now is struggling to survive and they're much smaller businesses. So that's what I think has really been the cause of us being slower than perhaps other sectors to, to make that significant change. Also, we go under the underneath the uh, under the sort of the, the the parameters which with which government big institutional investors you know start taking proxy action they they start with the very big corporations they they're starting with the big energy companies they're starting by shooting down shell and and others um you know in terms of the stock markets and 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 others so in a sense we've 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 avoided that pressure up to now but it's coming so um now is the time that businesses are going to have to start making this a priority in our sector too. Terrific. Well, thank you for that. Let me turn it over to Sam and I'll be back with you in a moment. Sam. Thank you. Um, Ufi, I'm interested in about uh, people are saying that the, the, the cost of, uh, of renewables and sustainability are higher. Uh, is there a reason for it or is it true that uh, the, the cost is higher? And could you just uh, share some light on, on this topic? Well, it's, it's just basic economics. It's just about demand and supply. And that's why the pricing is still relatively high, because at the moment, demand is outstripping supply. And, and that's where we are. And also, we are yet to develop certain technologies. You know, I cannot emphasize enough the fact that we collectively, humanity, is facing a very steep learning curve. A lot of these things are technical and require technical solutions. So, uh, you know, until such time that those solutions are developed and widely available, then the cost of those things that are currently available is going to be high. Um, so that's why collective schemes, you know, um, big procurement, bulk purchasing um, might help in certain areas like renewable energy. But there are still other areas where the costs are relatively high. At the same time, what's now happening is we're seeing the, this balance, this tilt, toward the penalties also becoming very high. So the brown discounts are becoming very, very high. So in the same way that if you're going to buy a house, you know, if the house doesn't have the right EPC certificate, the energy performance certificate, or there's a problem with the roof, or there's a problem with your plumbing, or, you know, there's a problem with other areas, you are going to apply a discount. Well, exactly that is happening with hotel assets right now. If the building is not sustainable, if the building has, um, you know, doesn't have a certain level of um, energy performance or 
doesn't have a certain level of a water performance or waste, now discounts are being applied by, as I said, the financial community and by lenders and by potential buyers of those assets. So we are beginning to see that while costs of acquiring renewable um, and sustainable products and services may be high, and it's lowering at the same time, the penalties of not switching to those products and services is actually um, increasing as well. Okay, very good. Uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, green financing. Uh, could you just share the, the whole approach to this? What is the benefit? I mean, I understand there's a clear benefit, but now is it also uh, what I have learned about many of the hotel investors traditionally, they invest for return in investment. They don't return for sustainability. So is there now the opportunity through this green financing and all that to create a more of a sustainable approach to the whole investment factor of, of tourism or, or a hotel, for instance? Absolutely. So, um, you know, being able to access, there are green bonds available in some financial markets. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, there's a, there's a green bond available. Now, to be able to um, access that green finance, the organization must meet certain ESG criteria. We are actively helping some of our members to achieve that criteria, working with Briam, in order for them to be able to access that finance. That finance is there. It is a significant resource. There have been a couple of um, businesses in our industry, the Edwardian Group, for example, the Londoner, that took advantage of um, green finance. I know that Whitbread PLC, owner of Premier Inn Hotels here in the United Kingdom, is actively um, preparing to to take um, a green bond as well. So there is significant funds available. Fantastic. What <laughs> yeah. a great opportunity. Um, so get your house in order to be able to take advantage of that green finance available to make the investments, to improve the longevity of your asset and so that you can truly stand up to scrutiny and say, we are performing um, at our best in terms of profitability, in terms of our social, in terms of our environmental, in terms of our governance, um, and contributing back to uh, to the non um, non extermination of, of humanity in the future. Very good. Okay, that's very exciting. Thank you very much for for this answer. And uh, over to you, Abid. Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, one last question, uh, uh, Ufi, before we bring our uh, next guest in. A, a, a new build obviously is easier, whether it's LEED or BRIAM. There, there are a few yeah. of the organizations that have got some standards set up. Retrofitting the existing buildings becomes a bigger challenge. Yeah. Uh, what tools are available? How can we go about complying on some of these uh, old, classic, beautiful hotels? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, of, there's a lot that the planning authorities require which perhaps limit the, you know, limit the extent to which we can make changes to those beautiful historical assets. So we need much more than um, merely the finance to be able to do it, the know-how to do it. We're very fortunate to have organizations like LEED and BRIAM. Um, we rely very much on BRIAM and their expertise in this area with our members, and we are seeing that a lot of solutions can be, can be provided. But we also need the regulators, we need the local planning authorities and others to actually participate and work with us so that we can actually have a public-private sector approach, particularly with those buildings that are protected, that are listed, um, you know, where it becomes much more complicated and therefore much more expensive to make the changes necessary to improve the environmental performance of those assets. Well, thank you. Please stay with us. We'll have you back. And our next guest has been helping a lot of the hoteliers and clients around the globe by implementing ESG strategies. Zinnia, thanks for being with us. Thanks for waiting. Talk to us a little bit about what are some of the key elements of an ESG plan uh, for the hotels? What should hoteliers be focused on? And have we moved beyond recycling and uh, uh, saving water and energy. Thank you, Abid, and thank you, uh, Sam, for having me here. Um, yes, I do believe we have moved beyond recycling and uh, saving water. Um, we've already heard a lot of input from the previous two speakers on this of, as to how it's come, how far we've come so far, even though we're still laggards. Um, I think the key effectively what is your impact where you are 
So a hotel typically in London will have a very different impact to a hotel in the Caribbean. So what is your, key, your main impact where you're operating? What are your low hanging fruits that you can address in the areas that you're operating? And also what are the climate goals or the, the, the government's goals of your country um, that you need to adhere to? So again, you know, the climate goals or the legislations that you will have in the UK around sustainability, or as we just heard from Ulfi, um, you know, with energy savings are going to be very different to what a hotel um, even in the US or as I just said, Caribbean or in Asia are confronted. So it's really just sort of looking at the broader picture, looking at what you can do, what your impact is, um, reducing that, and then also assessing what is your positive impact that you can have and what are the positive issues that you or, or, or projects that you can participate in, um, in order to, to, to mitigate for some of that impact. Um, if that makes sense. We're obviously always looking at the 17 um, SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, and which ones of these can you address? Now they all, they cover a wide array of issues that um, include environmental, social and governance issues. We will never as a hotel or as an operation be able to address all 17 goals. So again, pick those goals that are most pertinent to you, your business, and then um, start planning how you can um, make a difference there and make a change and put that into your strategy. It, Zinia, it, it, would you be so kind to share um, a couple of initiatives that led to improved profitability, but also, of course, they were sustainable practices? Yes, I mean, we've, again, we've heard quite a bit of Ufi about energy savings and, and the amount of cost savings you can have when you address areas around resource efficiency. Those are obviously always your low hanging fruits um, that you will make, you know, we also worked with the Edwardian group that Ufi just mentioned, um, did a series of um, initiatives with them and workshops and started tracking their energy consumption and they managed to reduce their bills by 97,000 pounds within six months. Now that's an enormous amount of saving. Um, obviously, again, when it comes to retrofits and things like that. But um, I think there are also other um, cost savings that are slightly more difficult to track and prove. A lot of those go around staff retention. Now we all as hoteliers know how high staff turnover can be, especially in cities. Um, and it has been proven that staff retention is, re is um, increased when you have a sustainability strategy, when you have green teams that staff are engaged in that have ownership of the process um, and they take responsibility for it. So there is another cost saving when it comes to your teams. Um, and then there's also obviously other cost savings within your supply chains. And, and I know we, we spoke about that briefly before. Jonathan addressed it. So looking at your supply chains, looking at how and where you do your shopping, um, your purchasing. Again, going locally is often much cheaper. You reduce not just CO2 emissions in your supply chain, but you can also reduce costs. You engage local suppliers. You have better produce. You have better relationships, less uh, loss of product as well. Um, so there's a huge amount of savings that you can do there. Um, and the same goes also for things like food waste, the way you purchase your food um, and the way you serve your food. You can be very clearly engaged in reducing costs on, on food waste. I mean, the cost we have in Europe for food waste is in the millions um, every year. So there's a huge amount of cost savings that can be done there. Zenia, it, you deal with hotels all the time. Uh, um, talk to us a little bit about the challenges. What prevents us from making some of these changes uh, permanent uh, so that it, it, we can gain grounds? I know you talked about uh, turnover and all hotels uh, experience huge turnover. I'm sure that's one of the causes. But what can we do as an industry to make this almost part of our operating DNA? I think it's a lot about um, taking, you know, uh, it's, it's sort of you take hold of the narrative and make it a positive narrative. Um, 
you know, um, I think we've been shamed a lot in the in the travel industry um, about this flight shaming that Jonathan mentioned before, and we've sort of and because we've been laggards, also we didn't have much to talk about it. But it's really saying, okay, what's our positive impact um, that we can make, and what are the positive stories that we can find that we need to tell, and that we can take our guests on the journey with us, right? The guests, there is more than enough market research now to prove that. Travelers want to choose responsible travel if they can, if it's on, on offer. So what are the stories we can tell our guests? What are the guest experiences we can create around nature conservation, around cultural conservation that we take our uh, hotel guests on a journey with us? Um, and, and, you know, possibly also, um, you know, we mentioned it before, some, if you are a hotel in a historic building where there's only that much energy efficiency you can get, what are the carbon mitigating projects you can get involved in? You know, obviously here in Europe, it's all about we can do planting of trees or we can look after peatlands, which are carbon um, binding. We can look into, again, it's your supply chain. Healthy soils are carbon binding. We have oceans. Look after your oceans. Um, I've got a hotel. I work with two hotels in the Caribbean where we do coral reef restoration programs. Those are carbon positive um, impact stories. You know, they're not huge, but they are. So we need to talk about these stories. We need the guests to get involved and to understand that we as a hotel industry, as a tourism industry, can be part of the conservation of the natural conservation of our planet because those are also places that tourists will want to visit. So again, it's this thing of, you know, the what what Jonathan was mentioning before, leaving it in a better shape. And we as hoteliers can do so much to be part of that. Well, is, is it that the industry is still somewhat stuck on the old classic practices um, and, and consumers are, are, are demanding something different, but the industry is not moving as fast? You know, these these water bottles in the guest rooms, I, I, it's been discussed at nauseum, but most of the hotels still have plastic water bottles in the rooms. It, it, I guess Jonathan had brought that up, and you are possibly in the best position to help us with the how. How do I overcome this? It's not uh, for lack of uh, not wanting to do it. It's possibly lack of not knowing how. I think it's a combination. I think, you know, um, we as hoteliers or the hotel industry is, in my mind, a very conservative industry. Um, you know, we've been, our, our story has been about, you know, we, we offer this Peter Pan vision of the world, right? People come and stay in our hotels and we want to offer them this perfect world, this fairy tale. So we can't talk about doom and gloom and we can't talk about climate change and pollution of the oceans and all of those things. So I think a lot of people have been quite scared because that's why a lot of people go into being hoteliers and they're good at making people feel um, at home and having a great time. So then you suddenly have to step in and make changes and, and, and talk about why. So it's just really what we try and do is empower these hoteliers to say it's okay, you can give guests a new option, just talk them through it. Like, you know, this one hotelier at the um, uh, at the Alberg uh, skiing resort uh, last year for Earth Hour or two years, you know, last year before COVID still, um, they said, we are going to have for Earth Hour, we're doing a whole month where we want to reduce our emissions. So we're just offering you turn down service once a day rather than twice a day. Of course, we're more than happy to come twice a day. Just let us know. And only... 1% of the guests request a turn, turn down service twice. So it's really having the courage to take that narrative into your hand and, and tell the story and again, take the guests and explain it to them. They will love it, but just talk to them. Well, you know, I was uh, reading a report um, uh, for greenhouse gas emissions to meet the Paris Accord. Uh, I, at least according to this report, it was said that uh, our industry will need the emission reduction by 90% by 2050 to be able to meet the standards. That seems like an insurmountable target where we are today. 
Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, it, what needs to happen today so that we can start chipping away at it and possibly chipping away at it in a, in a bigger, bolder way as opposed to small increments? A few things need to happen. I mean, obviously, the recognition that we all need to do something needs to happen, for sure. Um, I think partnerships, um, and Ufi mentioned this before, also public-private partnerships need to happen more. People need to reach out. I think, again, we've been trained to be competitors. You know, what the other hotel company is doing, we can't do vice versa. We need to work together stronger on these initiatives, um, be it, you know, putting pressure on suppliers to offer better products, um, being putting pressure on utility companies to have more renewable energy available. You know, we need to get together also um, as hoteliers and say we need to tackle our waste. Whatever it is, we all have the same problems. So we can all find the same solutions together. And the stronger we are in that, the better things will develop. I mean, I'll give you an example. For example, we've been working on the supply chain um, in de detail for one of our hotel groups. They have nine hotels across Europe. And Nespresso and Danone reached out to us because they knew that we are putting pressure on them. We said, we don't want to buy your Nespresso capsules anymore if you don't come up with better solutions. We don't want to buy your plastic bottles anymore. And so the innovation departments called us and said, we want to have call presenting you with our new products and our new supplies, and we want to hear your opinion of it. So it's, it's this thing you need to speak out. And Jonathan said that before. You need to make a point that you want change and be serious about it, and you will be heard, and solutions will come to you, but we need to get together to do that. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes in our industry, that appears to be the biggest hurdle of coming together because of what Ufi had mentioned. We are a very fragmented industry. Zinia, let me turn it over to Sam, and I'll be back with you in a moment. Sam. Thank you. Uh, I must uh, compliment you, Zinia. I was watching some of your YouTube videos where you talk about 50 shades of green and not to import French water for your hotels, but to use the local water and so on. I thought it was uh, all these lovely uh, small tips that you were sharing were valuable. So I recommend to any of our viewers to go to the YouTube and watch uh, these kind of uh, uh, that talks about sustainability. But uh, for a question for you, uh, the digital uh, transformation or the impact on technology uh, hotels are very slow in taking on board new technology because they want to wait. Uh, usually it's a question about, well, I wait until the, the, the neighboring hotel has implemented, I see how it works for them, and maybe I'll implement it. But in the kind of work that you are doing, are you having some technology that, for instance, you are collecting data so you can actually talk about facts, uh, what the hotels need to do in order to save some costs and so on and to be more sustainable? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I mentioned it earlier with what we did with the Edwardian Group. We have a data monitoring platform, which we use with all of our clients um, in order to understand, you know, we, we need to establish a baseline. Our um, data monitoring platform measures your energy consumption, your water consumption. We can measure waste and we can obviously have CO2 carbon emissions. It's a very operative system um, and it's aligned with the Hotel Carbon Measurement Index. Um, which is sort of the key index we have worldwide to know what our CO2 emissions per room nights are in the hotel industry. So data is really important. I'm so glad you mentioned this because to me, digital transformation and sustainability go hand in hand. We need data in order to be transparent. There was a really interesting article that I was sent today, um, a business news Business Travel News um, sent it today about there is a jungle of certifications out there, green certifications for the hotel industry that the end consumer doesn't understand. But what the end consumer does understand is data and transparency. So in my mind, this whole digital issue, and we very much work with innovation and we have not just our platform, but we have an app coming online again to help people with their energy consumption. It's all about using data to then communicate to your client. And now I'm not a data expert and I'm not a data person, but what we do is we take the data and we turn it into infographics or into snippets that you can then use. And that so you're basing your communication on facts and you're showing transparently where you were, where you want to go to and how you're going to get there and sort of show that also when it comes to ESG reporting, you need those data. When it comes to RFP processes, they all want data now. 
you know, you hear all the big companies saying we, we cannot deliver any more RFP if we don't have our sustainability data. So that digital part is key um, to the whole issue. Yeah. I, a couple of years ago, I was involved with the, you know, with the tourism in Malta. And one of the initiatives they were working on is to uh, provide for the members of the uh, of the hotel members of the Malta Hotel and Restaurant Association that they get some uh, tax credits uh, or get some incentive for them to uh, be, be saving and be more efficient and then to have some sort of a software where they can show their their, their savings and, and then in return uh, they will get at the end of the year some uh, tax credits for instance so I think that's a, 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 a one of the incentives that can be implemented for many hotels in in other part of the world yeah I mean absolutely and as Ufi was also saying you know when it comes to financing now if you don't have any green credentials the money is staying on the table you're not getting it yeah, so, exactly. you know, when you just need to have that data to prove on all fronts, not just to the guests, but also to your owners or your investors, whoever yeah. it is, yeah. um, it, it, it's key. Yeah. Good. Well, th thank you for this. And uh, may I hand over then back to Abid for the final questions? Uh, Sam, uh, if you don't mind, let's bring everybody back. But I have one more question for, for uh, Zania. Any particular trends that you can talk about over the last five years that you might have noticed within the hotel industry, uh, good, bad, or indifferent? I think, you know, obviously the trend was that suddenly plastics was like everywhere and everybody was talking about single-use plastics and, and let's get rid of plastics. Um, we're now um, into, you know, the food waste um, and, and, you know, all of these trends are very welcome at the end of the day. Um, they put spotlights on certain topics. Um, sadly, sometimes they also take the spotlights off again when they move on. Um, but you hope that those topics get solved. So then food waste was another big one. And then obviously now everybody's talking about net carbon zero because all these big companies and the governments and, you know, Joe Biden last week and the EU this week, also everybody's talking about their net carbon zero um, goals. And so uh, hotel companies are also scrambling and I'm getting all sorts of, you know, people asking me, what do we do? When do we declare our net carbon zero um, goals? And, and yet, as, as Ufi says, we're very far behind with just knowing and, and having data baselines. So there's still a way to go. But that's why I always also keep on insisting we need to find also the positive impact stories that we're, we can be involved in um, at a hotel level. So, uh, uh, Jonathan, if I may ask you this question, uh, concerns for our sector, uh, just a brief, brief, brief uh, uh, point of view, uh, short term and long term, what relative to sustainability, what should we be focused on? Jonathan, I think you muted. What an incredible session. You know, just a, you know, just incredible amount of information to um, that's been passed on here, and I, um, I'm so thrilled to be part of this conversation. What do I worry about? I worry about um, I worry about getting the information. You can't manage what you don't measure, and I I think that you know in the past we haven't measured um, these issues as much. I think the the in um, that our supply chain, the, our consumers, the the corporations that uh, rely on us are going to be demanding information from us that we don't have at the moment or we can't easily package up at the moment. And I think that, you know, again, you can't manage what you can't measure. We've got to be measuring that, as Zinia uh, was sort of mention, mentioning, um, that we need to be able to get in front of that um, quickly. That's a big thing. I think, you know, another issue, uh, and you've on it, you know, one of the, the big challenges that we have is, um, you know, when we build a when we build a hotel, that sort of sets in in place uh, to a large degree its energy efficiency and its its uh, environmental uh, efficiency. And so we've got a lot of um, installed base, old buildings that need to change, um, as well as encouraging new investors to be future-proofing their destina uh, their hotels so that they're taking into account the, the growing concerns about this. So we need to, we need to backtrack and, and fix some of, the, um, uh, some of the buildings that we have in place, and that's going to be challenging. Um, yep, yep, that, that is... Step that, that up. That, that, 
That is a big challenge, no doubt. Uh, Ufi, uh, fast forward five years down the line, um, what will be different in our industry? We will have a metric. Or let me ask you, will it be different or will we'll still be talking about uh, uh, plastic bottles in the guest room? It's going to be very different. Five years is a long time in today's, in today's um, contemporary times. In five years, we will, have, we will have a single standard metric for being able to actually measure floor area in a hotel. As I said, if you don't know your floor area in a hotel and there's no standard metric, it doesn't matter how many sustainability strategies or energy reports or anything that you have today, the data, arguably that is not robust. So we must get that right so that all of the work that is currently happening will make sense and will be, will be comparable. And unless we have that, the investors are going to see through that, you know, the, the financial community uh, takes data very, very seriously. So we have to be robust in our approach. And that's one of the key things that we will get right. We will also be getting right the fact that we will have a single standard of how to do it as well. You know, of how to do things, how to do them well. Because at the moment, there's so much available. There are so many strategies. There are so many statements. There are so many declarations. There are so many tools available. What is good practice? What is bad practice? We will be able to actually assess that analyze it and make decisions, inform decisions as to where to invest our very finite resources. Let's face it, running a business is about, is about your financial resources, right? We have to know how to invest that and get the right returns on investment. And in this case, of course, beyond the triple bottom line in terms of the returns on that investment. So we will have that right within five years as well. And also we will have built together the community to actually support each other so that when you're approached by sustainability consultants, and there's a lot of them out there, you can actually decide with who you should be working with on the basis of the community talking with each other, the community sharing information, sharing know-how, actually looking at technologies together, sharing notes, exchanging that information. So building that community. These are the three things, at the very least, that within five years, this industry will absolutely achieve. In fact, it's our ambition to achieve it in less than five years. Well, that's that's fabulous and very encouraging. One last question to the panelists. One thing for 2020 as a priority, and Zenia, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Uh, from your lens, what should be our priority? Oof, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough question as a, as a priority for this year. I think to really just... Um, as Ufi said, we need to recognize where we are at, that we are laggards, and to be honest about what we can achieve um, and, and just come out, but also not be pushed into the corner of these bad guys because, you know, this travel shame. I'd just like to point out uh, that Bitcoin mining um, has overtaken the hotel and travel industry and CO2 emissions by now, or the digital behavior. Bitcoin mining itself is you know, the energy usage of, of the country of Chile by now, every year. So I think as a travel industry, we, we need to just reassess and say, yes, we need to change and we will change. But yes, we are also part of um, a positive story. And let's just try and use that. And when we reopen and, and start build, opening our hotels again and, and bringing people back to travel. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. One focus area for 2020 uh, very quickly if you don't mind yeah sure you know there are many different things that we could do but the one that i would be saying is you know as an industry we need to be looking at our suppliers the energy the utility companies you know the water and you know the people who are above our industry but who determine a lot of the um performance of our industry and we need to recognize that we can do a lot internally, but we need to be working with these other groups as well to ensure that all of us have better results. Thank you. And, and Ufi, uh, you have the last word on this uh, one focus area. Climate change. OK, That's fair it. enough. <laughs> That's that, it. That, COP26, that is... COP26 is happening in a few months time. All the focus, all the emphasis is going to be on climate change. 
right now, um, as um, Gresby and other um, real estate, um, you know, communities are actually, you know, turning their focus, everybody is homing in on, there's one major priority right now in terms of ESG, it must be climate change, tackling and mitigating the risks related to climate change. Well, folks, thank you, thank you, thank you. It has been a fabulous conversation. Dr. Jonathan Day with Purdue School of Hospitality and Tourism Management, Ufi Ibrahim with the Energy and Environment Alliances, and Zania Hohenlo with Considerate Group. My thanks for you, uh, you participating in this conversation and making us more aware of the challenges. Thanks for joining us today. Over to you, Sam. Well, I'd like to, for my part, also thank all the live viewers who joined us. And a uh, big shout out to Emma Thornberry, Jaka Godesha from Slovenia, and Christy Hall. Uh, Christy had a question. I will pass it on to, to, to the panelists, and they can answer you directly on LinkedIn and so on. So uh, we'll, we will get back to you with an answer for that. But also that uh, this show is also available on, on YouTube as a replay, and we will also make a uh, podcast version of this, which you will find in, in uh, Hospitality Talks uh, podcast channel. So thank you very much again for joining us, and we will see you at the next episode. Thank Thanks, you very everybody. Much. Thank you.